All right. Well, today uh, we're going to continue this series called The Road to Repentance, where we're looking at uh, how important it is to pray for a spirit of repentance in our own lives and in the church and also in our society, because I really believe, and maybe you do too, that we're living in a world right now that really needs to repent and turn back towards God. Amen? Yeah, so we're going to just be looking at that and igniting that spirit of repentance in us. Uh, So as we do that today, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. So if you have your Bible and you want to follow along, uh, that's where we're going to be. Otherwise, I will have the uh, Scripture up on the screen. So Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied, and there were about 12 men in all. This is the Word of God for the people of God today, and everybody said, amen. (laughs) When I was a kid, I was about 10 years old, I had a cousin that I really, really looked up to, you know, and I just admired him so much um, because uh, a lot of things. One, he lived in the city. He lived in Imperial Beach, California. How cool was that? He had long blonde hair. He had a white Chevy van, and he always had a surfboard on top of the van. And this was at the height of the surf craze, you know, in the 60s, the mid-60s, late 60s. Uh, so I just thought he was the greatest. And he used to tell us stories. He would tell us how he and his buddies used to bring their surfboards to school. And as soon as the last bell rang, they would just run like a few blocks west with their surfboards and hit the beach. And I just thought, oh, man. Oh, I wish I could be you, you know. Oh, I wish I could have just a little piece of that life, you know. Well, 30 years go by, and I'm living by the beach, right? And I decide I'm going to learn how to start surfing. So I did. I learned how to surf. And even though I was, you know, a lifetime away from leaving school and hitting the beach and all that kind of stuff, still there was in the back of my mind this kind of like stoke, you know, about, man, you know, I finally got a piece of that, that life that I, that I wanted all those years. So when I saw my cousin around that time, I said to him, I said, you know, I looked up to you so much. You know, you had the hair, you had the van, you're this big surfer, you know. And now I'm surfing. I finally kind of made it. And you were my inspiration. And you know what he said to me? He had this big grin on his face. He said, you know, I never really surfed. I said, what? He said, Yeah, you know, I mean, I had the hair and I had the van and I had the board, but I used to run down the beach and stick it in the sand because that's what the girls liked. (laughs) He said, I kind of knew about surfing, but I never did it. I said, well, I think you're cool anyway, even for the hair and the van, you know. (laughs) But I thought of that story when I was reading this passage and thinking about this because it just reminds me that in life, uh, that's kind of what we do a lot of times, right? There are things that we know about, uh, but we don't necessarily know of. There are things that we, we have an idea about, we understand about, uh, but we don't really have an experience with them. And that's really okay, honestly, right? Because we can't experience everything that there is to experience in life. Um, And there are also things, a lot of things, right, that we really don't want to know of. It's okay to know about, but we really don't want to know of a lot of things in life. But it should never be that way with our faith, should it? It should never be that way with our faith. God gives us the gift of faith, the gift of a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. 
And that relationship is not something that we're supposed to put up on a shelf, you know, like a picture or a book and know about. It's something that's supposed to become part of us so it can really, truly change us from within. That gift of relationship with God is something that we are supposed to know of, not just about. And that's what I thought of when I, when I read this, this passage. See, we need to have that spirit about us that makes us want to embrace the transformation that God wants to make in each and every one of our lives, to really embrace that, to understand where we need to turn around, where we need to change in our lives to be inspired to make that change, and as we said last week, to be empowered then to actually follow through and make that change. And that comes from the Holy Spirit, the inspiration to change, to know what we need to do, and the power to actually do it. It all comes from the Holy Spirit. And it's that Holy Spirit power that we need to not just know about, but know of. Have that working in our lives. Now, in this passage, uh, Paul is out on his ministry journey, his missionary journey. It's the third one. And he's operating up in the Mediterranean and going to all of those cities up there where he's planted churches before. And now he's on his third uh, trip around visiting uh, these churches. It's about 25 years or so after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, and then his outpouring of his Holy Spirit on the apostles that gave birth to the church at Pentecost. You remember that story? Jesus outpours his Holy Spirit on the apostles, and it gives them the power to go out and start to affect Jesus' great commission. And that great commission was to go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them, what? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So these apostles and others are empowered to go out and start to do this thing, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But the thing about the church in these days where Paul is operating and where we're, we're looking at in Acts here, it's kind of like the Wild West in the church. There are a lot of churches spread out, but there's no real cohesion yet. There's no real cohesion. They're still wrestling a lot with what it means to be the church, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to live the Christian life. Now, we wrestle with those questions every day, don't we? In our context and every generation before us has wrestled with those very same questions. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to live a Christian life? But the difference between us and these guys in the beginning of the church is they had no written guidelines. They didn't have a New Testament the way that we think of the New Testament, a book bound together that we can go to to get uh, guidance and advice and to figure out what it is to be a Christian. They didn't have that. The letters of Paul, which make up most of the New Testament, most of those had yet to be written. There was no New Testament. There was no gospel, no recorded stories written down of Jesus' exploits and all of his teachings. These things were being communicated by word of mouth, in person. And so there were a lot of gaps in people's knowledge of what was going on in one part of the church as opposed to another part of the church. At the same time, within this period, there were a lot of people out there with a lot of opinions of how it is a person comes to God or who God even is. There were rabbis, there were prophets, there were teachers. There were all kinds of people out there talking about what it meant to be in relationship with God. So it was in this kind of atmosphere of rapid growth in the church, but at the same time, big gaps in people's knowledge about what it was to be a Christian, what it was to, to have faith at all, that Paul meets these men on the road. And these men are called disciples by uh, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts. He says they come upon these disciples. 
But in this context, disciple can mean a whole lot of things. So Paul wants to get to the, 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 the focus on who these people are, where they kind of are on the spectrum of their faith in Jesus or their faith in God, wherever they're at. He wants to understand where they're coming from. So he asks them this very key question. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? When you believed, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, this was the experience of these apostles at the time. When people would come into the faith, a lot of times they would receive visibly the Holy Spirit. You remember the story in Acts of Peter going to the house of Cornelius, who was a Gentile. He wasn't even a Jew. He goes into his house and he delivers. He gives him the gospel. And at that time, the Holy Spirit is poured out on these Gentiles who come to believe, and they have this similar experience. The Holy Spirit's manifest in their lives, and it was a sign to them that they were on the right track, that they were doing what God wanted them to do, going to all the nations, not just Jewish people, but Gentile people too, going to all the nations so that all might be included in this family of God. So Paul is zeroing in here on a, on, a, on, a, on a very important aspect of what it meant to be a Christian, to what it meant to be living the Christian life and following Jesus. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answer him, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asks them, well, what baptism did you receive? They say John's baptism, and now he has an idea of exactly where they stand. He knows what he's dealing with. He's dealing with some people who knew John the Baptist, so they probably were baptized by John the Baptist. They know probably of Jesus, but they don't, or they know about Jesus, but they don't know of Jesus. They don't even know about the Holy Spirit, and so they certainly don't know of the Holy Spirit. And there's a good reason for that. John's baptism, John the Baptist, his baptism was a baptism of repentance, but it was a baptism of preparation, preparation for what was to come. John the Baptist, you remember, he would bring people down to the Jordan River, and he invited them there to check out their hearts, to see where they were in their relationship with God, to take stock of their relationship with God, and then turn around and repent, turn around and go uh, from what they were doing towards God. But they were doing all of that under their own power. The repentance in John, that baptism in John, was like a promissory note. Anybody ever have a, or give a promissory note? It was like a promissory note or a notice of intention that they could have this baptism, but eventually it had to be cashed in. It had to be fulfilled by the one who was coming next in Jesus. And John said that much. He said that much. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you, John would say, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The Holy Spirit and with a fire of the Holy Spirit to purify and to transform, to purify and truly transform people's lives from the inside out. It's that kind of baptism that the John's baptism was pointing towards. And it's the kind of baptism that we have available to us uh, today. Now, we're not living in apostolic times. We're living in the era of the church. And the fact is, in the era of the church, anyone who is baptized, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, under the auspices of the church, has received the Holy Spirit. And I imagine that's everybody here, right? Have we all been baptized? If not, see me after church? But yeah, we've all received that seed of the Holy Spirit 
Every single person who's been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit was drawn there by the power of the Holy Spirit, whether we were infants or whether we came later. We are drawn there by the grace of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And at that time, we were claimed and marked and set aside for God. Amen? Yes. Claimed, marked, set aside for God and brought into the beautiful family of the church. But even though we've been brought and marked and claimed by God, from that moment on, we have a responsibility. We have a call. We have a privilege, really, to respond to that baptism, to live into the promise of that baptism. And that takes What? It takes prayer. It takes true self-reflection. It takes study in the Word. It takes worship. It takes gathering with God's people. And it takes repentance. And I mean a true repentance that really desires to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. Yes? That's how we live into the promise of our baptism. What's been given to us by the Holy Spirit We respond to, we respond to, and grab hold of. But you know, as well as I do, it's not always easy to do that, right? It's easy to fall into a situation in our faith where we start to become a little complacent. Uh, We start to have a little malaise about our faith. We start to treat our faith like it is a book or a picture that's just sitting up on the shelf. And that's not having a real impact on us. It's something that we start to just know about, but that we don't know of on a daily basis. And that's something we all have to look out for. It's something that they, they, were, they were warned about in the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets talked about the same thing. You remember how in the Old Testament you'll find the, the people of Israel... And they always have all these ceremonies and rituals and tearing of clothes and lamenting over their sin and remorse for their sin. But the prophets, Isaiah and Hosea and Amos and all of them, they would warn the people that their repentance needed to be heartfelt. It couldn't degenerate just into something that was external, that God wanted people to rend their hearts and not just their clothes. I mean, what a waste of clothes, right? God wanted people to rend their hearts, to want to change their lives in a real way, in a heartfelt way. That was Jesus' uh, message throughout his ministry, too. It's the message that comes to us. that That's what God treasures in us. That heartfelt desire to trust in him to follow Him, to change our lives in accordance with His will, to do the things that that, that add up to our becoming the beautiful things that Jesus, that God sees in us, the beautiful things. You know that song that we sing, you make beautiful things, you make beautiful things out of dust. (laughs) It's by that power of the Holy Spirit. It's by our, our true desire to change. And letting the Holy Spirit empower that desire that changes us from dust to beautiful things. And it isn't just a one-time transformation that we do when we're converted, even though that's all true. It's a day-to-day-to-day thing. It's about the little tiny repentances. It's about the little turnings away and turnings toward by that power of the Holy Spirit. That we turn away from impatience to patience. That we turn away from unkindness to kindness. That we turn away from envy towards a real spirit of joy for the successes and the good fortunes of others. By those little tiny turnings that we turn from the 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 tyranny, really, of our emotions, our anger, our resentments, our fears, all those things. 
There's a beautiful freedom that comes with self-control, a beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit. It's those little turnings every single day that make the most difference in our lives and the difference in the lives of others. It makes life better for our children, makes life better for our spouses, makes life better for everybody we know, makes life ultimately better for ourselves. It's all of that, those little turnings that change us when they are truly empowered by the Holy Spirit. When we stop just thinking about Jesus and about the Spirit, but we let Jesus and His Spirit become of us and really changing us from within. That power, that power is available to every single one of us. In fact, it's been given to every single one of us. For us, what we need to do is just ignite it, turn it on. Pray for it to be manifest in us. Well, once Paul had, you know, figured out and ascertained where these people were on the spectrum of, of faith, he told them that John had told people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. Uh, and they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. The Holy Spirit was poured out on them in such a powerful way that they had special spiritual gifts. But listen, aside from those spiritual gifts, those evident spiritual gifts, you know that they were also given. The Holy Spirit power to truly repent, to truly turn their lives around, to understand their need, and then have the power to follow through, make that a reality in their lives. It's the same power that you and I have, the same power that God has given us. It's that same power that we can pray to receive every single day. Next week, we're going to look at how it is that remorse can really be a catalyst to repentance. But this week, let's just do remember this gift of a relationship with God through Jesus Christ is a gift that is not meant to be put on a shelf just to know about, but to make part of our lives and to do it every single day. Amen? Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is, oh God, and what a mystery it is, Lord, that you have given us your Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us and to empower us. But dear God, give us the grace this very day to call on you, to draw nearer to you, open ourselves up to the transforming power of your Holy Spirit. We ask this